Yeah, welcome to the lecture series, Abstraction and Economy, that we started on the occasion of the move of the University of Applied Arts into the former post office savings bank in Vienna, built by Otto Wagner. The lecture series examines the tension between abstraction and economy from different perspectives of art and architecture theory, history, as well as law, sociology, philosophy, and economics. We want to address questions about the current challenges of a global economy with its claim to expansive growth in relation to aesthetics, technology, and democracy. We ask about the role of art between concretion and abstraction and discuss formalistic approaches to art theory with its claim of autonomy, as well as the social and economic aspects that critical theory takes into account in order to track down the aesthetic regime of capitalism. Okay, so um, yeah, after the talks by Brenner Bender and Sven Lütteken, um, we will open up to a discussion and I will therefore also stop the recording. Um, you can um, raise your questions by, um, uh, ask your questions by raising your digital hand or also um, writing into the, the chat. You can either ask the questions in English or in German. Um, the lectures that we already did, um, the videos are um, on our YouTube, on the Angewandte YouTube channel, and you can um, uh, see the link on the website of the Kunst- und Wissenstransfer at Angewandte. So um, we are very happy to um, welcome Brenner Bender who is Associate Professor at Allard Law, University of British Columbia. So thank you very much, Brenner Bender, for joining us today. And um, uh, yeah, the stage is yours. OK, great. Um, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to take part in this seminar. Um, I do really wish that I were there because the uh, significance of the space that you're in is so germane to the, the topics that we are um, covering. Um, but uh, I want to begin with a land acknowledgement, an acknowledgement of where I am situated. Um, I'm speaking from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Quiquitlam First Nations. Um, I'm speaking from the unceded and traditional lands of these First Nations and their relationships to, to these lands um, uh, continue on into the present. So I'm going to now um, launch into a talk about legal abstraction and some of the the violence inherent in legal abstraction, particularly as it pertains to colonial land appropriations. Um, economic and juridical processes of abstraction are in many ways at the very foundation of colonial land theft. What forms of representation are adequate to grasp the contradictions, the ambiguities, the violence, the refusal and rejection which inhere in the colonial appropriation and the continued exploitation of indigenous lands in the colony. Dirk Schmidt's work, The Division of the Earth, uh, Tableau on the Legal Synopsis of the Berlin Africa Conference, grapples with the seemingly impossible task of representing the complexities of legal abstraction. And specifically, the colonial legal techniques that rendered much of an entire continent the possession of various European nation states. Schmidt presents us with images that prompt the viewer to consider how acts of epistemic violence coupled with the force of law render entire people's relations to their land, their forms of government, along with their social relations, and economies, how these legal techniques render all of this, uh, uh, all of these life worlds legally obscure, if non-existent. In the form of image maps, Schmidt produces cartographies that allude to specific territorial sites 
with accompanying indices that, quote, offer an overview of the stakes and outcomes of the Berlin Conference as defined by European imperial powers, end quote. The tableau invites the viewer to recall the many and varied colonial techniques of land appropriation that relied on the creation of a colonial order of sovereignty and property law that was based on an abstract commodity vision of land. Despite the vast differences in these historical moments from the high point of European colonial rule in the late 19th century to the contemporary state of settler colonial reconciliation politics in Canada, Australia, and elsewhere, the modalities of legal abstraction remain intact, even if altered by cunning forms of liberal recognition. Legal abstraction deals in forgeries, committing fraud on people who find themselves not of their own not of their own volition, rather, but through an uneven and combined mix of consent in the Gramscian sense, coercion and lethal violence living within jurisdictions of European colonial power. As Glenn Coulthard writes in his uh, book, Red Skin, White Masks, and here I'm quoting from Glenn Coulthard, in this respect, Canada is no different from most other settler colonial powers. In the Canadian context, colonial domination continues to be structurally committed to maintain through force, fraud, and more recently, so-called negotiations, ongoing state access to the land and resources that contradictorily provide the material and spiritual sustenance of indigenous societies on the one hand, and the foundation of the colonial state formation, settlement, and capitalist development on the other, end quote. And we can take as an example of this uh, tendency the current struggles over state-backed corporate extractivism on indigenous lands. So um, I'm referring, for example, to the uh, current um, land defenders movement in Northern British Columbia of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation, who are attempting to um, stop coastal gas link from constructing a um, pipeline to transport oil through their lands. In a widely remarked upon instance of colonial capture, one of the leading judgments on Aboriginal title in Canada explicitly identified, and I quote, the, de the development of agriculture, forestry, mining, and hydroelectric power, the general economic development of the interior of British Columbia, protection of the environment or endangered species, the building of infrastructure and the settlement of foreign populations, as the kinds of objectives that can, in principle, justify the infringement of Aboriginal title, end quote. So I'm quoting from the judgment of the Delgamote case. Uh, the judgment was rendered in 1997 by the Supreme Court of Canada, and that was the first judgment in Canadian legal history to define the content of Aboriginal title. And in that judge, in the course of recognizing Aboriginal title and defining it, they list that um, all of those activities that can that can legitimately infringe Aboriginal title. So this is the cunning of legal liberal recognition. In the same moment of recognizing Aboriginal title, they identify that long laundry list of things I just read out as things that will legitimately legally impinge or infringe uh, um, um, Aboriginal title. So this ample justification for the infringement of Aboriginal title has been at the basis of the violent state enforcement uh, in, in this moment of an injunction granted to a private corporation intent on transporting oil through Wet'suwet'en lands, the territory that was, in theory at least, held to be subject to Aboriginal title in the very same Delgamook judgment. So the Delgamook, uh, judgment from 1997 was about Wet'suwet'en traditional lands. And it's in this moment now uh, we see the state, the courts granting injunctions to corporations to uh, violate that very 
uh, right, that very uh, land right. Perhaps one of the most significant conceits of legal abstraction as it operates in the field of property law is the separation of sovereign power, which is situated in the realm of public law from property ownership, comprising a core element of private law. Early modern theorizations of sovereignty prized the concept of sovereign power away from feudal relations of proprietorship, aligning sovereignty with the state and property with society, civil society. However, there is an undeniable relationship between the sovereign assertion of control over territory and the mechanisms through which the state organizes individual private property ownership. The concept of possession in one register is taken as an analogy in another. The rhetorical force of mastery and control is deployed across a multitude of incongruent fields of ownership. Sovereignty is asserted over, over territory and is conceived of in the same way as an individual owns his property exclusively. Moreover, it is clear that the power of the colonial sovereign to control land and territory has always relied upon the force of the individual petty sovereign who with the backing and blessing of the state makes land waste in order to appropriate it. And I'm borrowing the term petty sovereign from the work of Judith Butler and as it's been taken up by Mohawk um, scholar uh, Audra Simpson. The Berlin Conference produced an imperial rule book based in an international consensus that was limited to European public law and did not include any African societies. How does one investigate these forgeries of colonial law, which is to say modern law? How does one represent the formation of common and civil law systems that were forged through colonial encounters rooted in racial civilizational myths as well as a will to profit that had no truth value for those dispossessed of their land. Thinking through the specificities of abstraction as a mode of thought, as well as real social, economic and historical processes that were absolutely central to colonial land appropriation raises many questions about the messy and non-linear dialectical forces that produce particular racial regimes of ownership. Drawing on the work of Cedric Robinson, our question becomes how a quote, unstable truth system comes to gain the appearance and power of a hegemonic system of meaning, yet one that remains vulnerable to the forces of resistance and rupture that help constitute its very form. So what I have in mind when I'm thinking about that is the very instability in, in what comes to look like in the uh, settler colony, a very stable regime of private property ownership. And when we look to the history of colonial land appropriation, instead what we see are a great number of contradictions and ambiguities and, in, and instability. The creation of a false distinction between the material world and ideal notions, for example, of juridical status, um, and also the reification of concepts that are divorced from the social and political realities from which they emerge, all work to naturalize an order of individual private ownership. In the domain of property, the legal forgeries that seek to cover up multiple and complex relations to land, to obscure forms of use that did not conform, historically speaking, to agrarian capitalist ideologies of cultivation, find their expression in a range of legal techniques. One such technique of abstraction is land titling, and specifically the institution of land title by registration. The imposition of systems of title by registration first occurred in a widespread basis in the colonies of South Australia, British Columbia, 
and elsewhere during the mid 19th century before it became instituted on a national level in the United Kingdom 60 or 70 years later. And I explore this at some length in the Colonial Lives of Property book. There's a lot of elements of a system of common law um, property that we assume were developed in England and then transported to the colonies. And actually what we see upon closer examination is that um, systems of private ownership like um, title by registration were actually uh, sort of uh, unfolded in the settler colonial context where, which was kind of used as a legal laboratory before being imported uh, back to the uh, UK. The commodity logic of property that rendered land as an equivalent to any form, any other form of property provided rationales for the creation of land title registries in the colonies. And it's significant in terms of this legal technique of abstraction as residing in the form of a register, a legal register, that during the early to mid 19th century, registries which function as a bureauc bureaucratic archive of legally recognized ownership interests actually explode across many different domains. Um, in the, you know, before abolition, you had the creation of slave registries, um, and then moving on post abolition into the 19, mid 19th century, you have the creation of life insurance registries, etc. Um, the colony was conceived of by English land law reformers as quite conveniently free of a self-governing population with recognizable pre-existing ownership of the land, much like the views of the Belgian, French, and Germans present at the Berlin Conference. The drive to render land as fungible as possible that had been pursued since the 17th century in England emerged amidst the long transformation in which credit instruments and debt became central features of a globalized political economy. The colony envisioned as vacant provided one site among, uh, among systems that were forged through colonial encounters. Oh, sorry, I've got to. The colony envisioned as vacant provided one site among others for the emergence of legal, political, and economic forms that continue to shape our current moment. The racial and property abstractions that are encoded in the doctrine of terra nullius reflect a dual vision of property and race that continue to shape voracious forms of land speculation and increasingly financialized modes of real estate investment. One which continually reenact the appropriation of indigenous lands, both in rural areas as well as the urban uh, space of residential property. Property and urban planning laws, financialized real estate speculation and their attendant tax regimes effectively materialize a jurisprudential illusion of empty uninhabited space. The political imaginary of uninhabited land or land that was not properly inhabited for the purposes of ownership requires force to fabricate abstract parcels of land for the purposes of investment and possession. The rendering of land into the abstraction of property comes only after the making waste of land that was stewarded, used, lived on, etc., for thousands of years by indigenous peoples. One of the key legal doctrines that facilitated the settlement of indigenous land was preemption. So like title by registration, we have another um, legal technique, the doctrine of preemption, that allowed um, white settlers to stake out territory and upon improving the land by cultivation to obtain ownership of that land. So the first preemption acts where I'm situated in British Columbia and Canada enabled the settler to preempt up to 160 acres of land. This is in the late 19th century. Um, and after two years of cultivating that land, 
if they were to make permanent improvements on the land up to a certain value, um, they would gain title to that land. Now, this system of land appropriation is a clear reflection of a Lockean philosophy of ownership, right? So a settler could preempt land and come to own it by mixing his labor with it and cultivating it to a suitable standard determined by colonial authorities. And in many histories of uh, colonization, um, the tendency or the, or the narrative that, that you know, uh, scholars and others have created over time is that through a European uh, colonial gaze, land that was not cultivated according to an agrarian capitalist imaginary was rendered waste or seen as waste and therefore open for appropriation. And that is not untrue. That is definitely um, a key uh, justification for land appropriation in the colony. Um, but we also know that from historic, we know from historical testimony of indigenous peoples in British Columbia, that land that was preempted by settlers was often taken by brute violence and force. Land that was not, even according to settler law, supposed to be preempted included Indian settlements, which were, it seems, never defined in, in law. So to argue that property law and appropriation are the motor force of colonialism is to really point to the violence that inheres in legal abstractions. Property is a legal abstraction, but in the settler colony only materializes with the presence of violence. The violence of turning land into property, the violence of seizing land from people inhabiting and using that land and placing it within the exclusive use of a white settler population. We, we might think here about the originary violence that founds the law, and we might consider the incommensurability between justice and law, as Derrida wrote in The Force of Law, The Mystical Foundations of Authority, a piece heavily indebted to Walter Benjamin's Towards a Critique of Violence. What we know about settler colonialism and law is that this founding violence has to be continually reenacted, continually reinstantiated for the settler regime to maintain its authority in the face of indigenous resistance as we are witnessing in our current moment uh, in Wet'suwet'en lands in, um, in Northern British Columbia. Inverting Proudhon's famous phrase, Robert Nichols has persuasively argued that acts of dispossession are what recursively constitute relations that are recognized as property interests in the very same moment that they are extinguished. This recursivity has produced a fundamental paradox for those resisting their very dispossession. And here I'm quoting from Robert Nichols in his wonderful book, Theft is Property, quote, the language of property and possession now functions as a dominant mode of political expression to the extent that it has become difficult to voice opposition to these processes without drawing upon the conceptual and normative frameworks they have generated." End quote. Colonial capitalist accumulation is continually recreated through a series of forgeries the traffic in the currency of legal fictions and abstractions. Representations of territory created by state authorities and now industry who assert their ownership in spirit and fact bear little if any relation to the lived relations of use and political organization that coexist in the same space. The sheer complexity of people's struggles to get their land back and in the context of urban spaces to obtain and hold on to adequate housing have both been increasingly determined by neoliberal economic and policy frameworks driven by privatization, deregulation, and financialization. Financialized abstractions attempt to eviscerate the complexity of people's lived realities 
their attachments to and struggles over land as well as urban space. It is no wonder then that resistance to both the inadequacies of the legal framework of recognition and the violence of predatory and financialized extractivism in both rural and urban sectors have taken the form of collective action that utilizes a wide range of tactics from blockades and increased communal social provisioning to legal advocacy, to the assertion of indigenous legal systems and anti-capitalist notions of use and value. Excavating the heady mixture of negotiation, consent, refusal, and resistance that all shape neo-imperial modes of rule is a way of revealing their vulnerabilities and weaknesses so as to claim the debts accrued through the violent processes of juridical abstraction. And I will leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Brenna, for um, for this insight. And um, so um, we will have both lectures um, after each other and then open up for, for the questions. So please, for the audience, if you um, have any questions right now, please write them down and remember after the, so we can um, try to find a um, discussion together. Okay, thank you very much, um, Sven, um, Sven Lütteken. We're very happy that you are here tonight joining us and um, very much looking forward to your uh, lecture. Sven Lütteken is an art historian and he teaches uh, currently at the Freie University in Amsterdam. Thank you. you uh... Thank you, Jenny. Um, yeah, good to be here, wherever here may be. Um, yes, I uh, suppose I will pay. Uh, I will play the part of the classicist in that I will focus more on economic abstraction. But of course, um, yeah, as has been amply um, demonstrated, as has been argued extensively in recent years by a number of authors, uh, including Brenna, you can't really disentangle. Uh, legal abstraction from economic abstraction so it's um, it's a certain shift in emphasis but i will also touch upon the um, the sort of the legal dimension at at various um points let me share screen being an art historian i have pictures um professional deformation i suppose um let's see oops second there we go and i thought actually i would start by briefly returning to um a moment that i thought was rather wonderful in nikita davan's uh, lecture some weeks ago when she asked this question whether uh, art is system relevant right that's that was this debate uh, certainly in german media or German language media uh, during COVID is art actually relevant, relevant to the, the maintenance of the system? Um, indeed, should museums be allowed to be open, etc., uh, just like supermarkets, because they're essential. So is the Kunst system relevant? Um, and then she asked, uh, well, is art perhaps uh, relevant im falschen system, right? So um, what is the system that we're talking about? Indeed, a, a system of financialized capitalism. She then uh, discussed NFTs as you know, one symptom of perhaps art being relevant in the wrong system. And I just thought that might be a good starting point for what I want to um, discuss, which is indeed um, the question whether uh, there is uh, another system that is that is imaginable, that is that is thinkable. So, is there indeed a, an imaginary that can be developed in which uh, life is not completely uh, colonized, if you will, by the value form and uh, the legal form? And what role might might art, might artistic practices also have to play in um, uh, developing such um, imaginaries? Now, the framework um, for my discussion is the return of the so-called socialist calculation debate 
uh, which was first waged uh, from the 1920s to the 1940s. So we don't really start with art, we start with an economic and political debate. Uh, I found this um, kind of um, yeah, slide online, which also gives us a glimpse of how this debate keeps being summarized and regurgitated as this endless sort of back and forth, this kind of ping pong between the the proponents of socialist planning, whom you see there on the left, uh, Maurice Daub and um, 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 who else do we have? Uh, Oskar Lange in the lower left-hand corner. And then on the right, we have Ludwig von Mises uh, and Friedrich uh, Hayek. And so on the left, uh, we have um, leftists, perhaps not Marxists, arguing that uh, planning actually would be a superior system to the free market, to the anarchy of the so-called free market. And on the right, we have um, uh, we have um, European, specifically Austrian also, economists, um, liberal, neoliberal economists, arguing that actually you can't uh, beat the market system, or you certainly cannot improve upon it. What we see here is that, curiously enough, the leftist proponents of planning, of socialist planning, are not necessarily Marxists in the economic sense. They may or may not have self-identified as Marxists politically uh, speaking at various points, but as economists, they actually were proponents of neoclassical economics, whereas Marx, of course, uh, developed a certain version of um, classical economic theory. And with Marx, we have the value form. So for instance, we have a coat, uh, the value of a coat equaling the, the value of 10 yards of linen. So we have this value form, but then uh, as part of the capitalist value form, we also have the sort of underlying reality of value always being anchored in labor. So to quote Max Haven briefly, for Marx, all prices, even those in the most seemingly straightforward economic transactions, are skewed representations of the real value. Value is ultimately the productive capacity of labor that, through the process of capitalist explo exploitation, becomes encrypted in the commodity. So prices for Marx, for the tradition of classical economics or political economy, is not prices are not realized on the market through this sort of interplay of supply and demand, right? That's sort of basically the illusion of commodity fetishism. Um, values are really, value is ultimately anchored in, um, in socially necessary labor time for Marx. Uh, this is then sort of translated, this is then realized in the realm of exchange value and exchange value is then realized on the market in the form of prices. But there's this whole underlying um, substance, if you will, of value. Whereas for neoclassical economic theory, actually uh, all of that doesn't really matter. It's all about how actors, rational actors on the market are willing to pay this for a certain product uh, or they're willing to sell it for a certain price. So that's when price, uh, when uh, supply and demand come together and when prices are realized. We don't really need this whole Marxian infrastructure. We don't need any basically substantial, substantive uh, notion of value as being anchored in uh, socially necessary labor time. Uh, or indeed, we don't need any account of uh, yeah, the appropriation, uh, the exploitation, for instance, of cheap nature, huh, to put it in contemporary parlance in Jason Moore's words, we don't need any account really of the violent, indeed, extractivist appropriation of, yeah, of terra nullius, of slave labor, we don't really need all of that. In neoclassical economic theory, we have this kind of fantasy world in which uh, free and rational actors on the market ultimately uh, determine the price. Um, now for these, um, uh, let's say, right-wing, liberal, neoliberal economic theorists, such as Mises and Hayek, the socialist um, planners were mistaken. Um, yeah, you cannot actually improve upon the system. So for people like um, um, Landauer, for instance, or Oskar Lange, um, it would be possible actually to um, improve upon the anarchy of the free market. If economics is all about balancing supply and demand, then it's, as H.M. Dickinson uh, summarized the socialist uh, position, then the beautiful systems of economic equilibrium described by neoclassical economic theorists uh, are not so much descriptions of society as it is, but prophetic visions 
of a socialist economy of the future. So for people like Oskar Lange and Gustav Landauer, socialism's task was to make economic reality approximate neoclassical models through planning, and planning would be able to do the job better than the free uh, market. Now for Hayek, for instance, this was a fallacy because you need the price as something that is in a sense performatively realized, if I may put it in my own terms, on the market. Um, that then allows actors to decide whether they are willing to pay something or not uh, for a product, whether they are willing to pay that price. Um, basically, if socialist planners try to set the price by calculating, by uh, compiling tons of information, uh, they will always end up imposing something, right? They will end up imposing something top down and they will in a sense uh, prevent this performative interplay from taking place um, on the market. And you will actually get a kind of, you will, add a, you will get a kind of gridlock. It will, it will all grind uh, to a halt. Now, um, there has been sort of uh, indeed um, a reenactment or there is an ongoing reenactment of this socialist uh, calculation debate in the context of contemporary big data. An important article is by uh, Evgeny Morozov, uh, published in the New Left Review. In German, there is this uh, rather uh, brilliantly edited volume by Timo Daum and Sabine Nuss, Die unsichtbare Hand des Plans. So there is this um, new version of the socialist calculation debate, and that's something that I will uh, return to. But first, let me also make the connection with yeah, visual practice with artistic practice. And I will do this by focusing on the singular case of Otto Neurath and Otto Neurath's artistic collaborators. So Otto Neurath was quite a, a strange sort of um, case um, um, among these advocates of socialist planning in that Neurath um, advocated an, imonet, uh, an economy in kind and a natural wirtschaft. So whereas all the others, all the other advocates of socialist planning um, basically were fine with uh, staying with basically some version of the price system, they just wanted to create a planned version of that. They were fine with still having an economy that uses money, right? The value form as expressed in money, the money form, the socialist planners were on the whole fine with that, but Otto Neurath back to differ. So Neurath throughout his career in, in a fairly sort of, um, in a, in a fairly almost obsessive manner, advocated a, an economy in kind, a, a natural Wirtschaft as a, sort of the true socialist um, economy that one should at least work towards, even if it couldn't be realized straight away. So in 1919, Neurath presented his vision of this um, planned economy in kind. Um, in, um, he presented this vision to the um, Supreme Soviet of Bavaria, the Räterepublik Rät in Bayern. So this is uh, this was published as Wesen und Weg der Sozialisierung. You see the title page here, uh, Gesellschaftstechnisches Gutachten vorgetragen in der achten Vollsitzung des Münchner Arbeiterrates am 25. Januar 1919. So he presented his vision to the um, highest um, Arbeiterrat, the highest Soviet, the highest workers' council in the short-lived uh, workers' Republic in the short-lived Council Republic, Soviet Republic of Bavaria in the context of the um, basically November Revolution in uh, Germany and its, its um, sort of various local uh, offshoots. Now, uh, what Neurath then uh, said basically, or one of the things he said to the uh, highest council in Bavaria is basically that he was quite skeptical about workers' councils, in the sense that he was quite skeptical about a bottom-up system in which workers would all take control of their factories, of the companies, they would socialize them, they would then be self-managed by the workers through councils, but Neurath argued um, that actually won't work because uh, society, a socialist economy, needs central coordination. It needs a fairly strong form of central planning. So it's all fine and good to have these councils in the individual uh, organizations, in the individual companies. It's fine to have councils at the level of um, yeah, sectors of industry, but you also need a central council that ultimately uh, hands down the guidelines. So uh, sort of top down um, model rather than a bottom-up 
uh, model. Um, I don't know how the Bavarian Soviet uh, responded to that, but in any case, it was a, a fairly short-lived um, social and political uh, experiment. However, Neurath really pursued this focus on planning uh, and on planning in the form of a Naturalwirtschaft, uh, of an economy uh, in kind, pretty much throughout his career. So this, for instance, is the cover of an American a statistical journal survey or of its, its sort of graphic um, um, uh, supplement. And uh, this was an issue on yeah when we choose to plan, because of course, in the context of the economic crisis, the depression of the 1930s, uh, there was indeed a, a need for uh, planning because clearly the, the anarchy of uh, the so-called free market uh, in the service of uh, corporations and financial speculators uh, didn't really uh, benefit uh, most people, not even sort of, uh, um, not even white, uh, the white middle classes or uh, let alone white workers in the industrialized nations. Um, so here we see an example of the uh, form of built statistic of pictorial statistics, which Neurath um, developed <clears throat> together with visual artists such as Gerd Arns. Um, so here um, we see that um, for instance, um, uh, the amount of um, cars is is uh, the, is quantified and then visualized by uh, giving a certain number of car symbols, which then stands for a certain number of you know so many thousands or millions of cars being produced. So it's it's a visualization basically of uh, of quantification of quantitative statistics. Um, but for Neurath, it's it's more than that. It is actually also um, a kind of uh, incubator um, for the future coming economy in kind. Because for Neurath, this is actually also a way to train people in thinking, not primarily in monetary terms, but really in terms of uh, the actual products, the actual goods that are, that are needed, that are produced somewhere, uh, that um, uh, maybe uh, may need to be reallocated in some way. Um, so for Neurath, uh, this kind of built statistic indeed is also in a sense a school, a school that would train people in thinking, not primarily in terms of the monetary form, not in terms of the value form, but in terms actually of, of, um, of the naturalien that ultimately matter in life, right? That, that sort of sustain life. Um, Neurath, sure, also bought into a certain type of early 20th century productivism. Um, there are many sort of criticisms we can level at Neurath, but I would like to uh, emphasize this as a rather uh, intriguing uh, feature of his system. However, I would also briefly like to contextualize this in the broader um, discussion of the, of the post-World War uh, I situation about uh, the nature of communism and the nature of socialism, uh, um, the desirability of this or that uh, um, way forward towards the future uh, classless uh, and free society. So, um, okay, here we have this slide with some images that come out of this sort of um, a very volatile situation of Germany uh, in particular, um, starting in 1918, 1919, uh, the um, sort of abortive German revolution in which a strong council communist movement indeed emerged. So uh, many on the German left, of course, also um, expressed their solidarity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the October revolution and the Soviet Union in Russia, right? But the Soviet uh, Union indeed bore the name, uh, so the term Soviet, indeed council, workers' council in its name, but many fairly quickly became uh, skeptical and critical as to whether uh, that society, that state, uh, deserved to be called a council union, a union of councils. Was it actually not uh, fastly becoming a, a, a party dictatorship, right? A Bolshevik dictatorship. So in Germany and also Holland, a kind of, kind of German-Dutch uh, council communist movement emerged that uh, became increasingly um, negative. Uh, towards uh, Bolshevism and the Soviet Union. Um, it uh, expressed a rejection also, of course, of bourgeois elections, the whole election system, representative democracy. Um, that needs to be rejected because all power needs to go to the councils, the workers' councils. Now, one artist um, or a number of artists we see actually um, working uh, 
in that context, for instance, also on the pages of Franz Pfemfert's um, uh, journal Die Aktion, uh, that developed a very strong council communist stance, thanks to Pfemfert and also Otto Rühle. Um, on the pages of the Aktion, we, for instance, encounter an artist such as Franz Wilhelm Seiwert, uh, who was the, the leader pretty much of the uh, Kölner Progressive, the Cologne Progressives movement uh, or group of artists. Another artist from that um, circle was Gerd Arns. And Gerd Arns was indeed one of the key artists developing um, Otto Neurath's uh, system of pictorial statistics uh, with and and for uh, Neurath. So uh, we have a certain um, field, I would say here, of marked by a dialectical tension, a dialectical tension between um, visions of socialist planning that uh, revolve around indeed a centralized, uh, let's say, supreme Soviet that determines economic policy on the one hand, and this um, uh, if you will, more uh, emancipatory uh, grassroots vision of uh, workers' councils, uh, rebuilding, remaking society from below. But of course, the council communists were also highly aware of the fact that you can't just, let's say, you can't just liberate or socialize one company, one factory, right? You can't, just as you can't have socialism in one country, right, which spelled the doom of the Soviet Union, you certainly can't have socialism in one factory, because then you would just be an isolated cooperative and you would still be beholden to the rule of the value form. And of course, you would also never be allowed to run uh, your factory as a uh, socialist experiment because of course fairly quickly due to the continuing existence of the uh, bourgeois uh, liberal juridical apparatus there would be a clamp down and of course the factory would uh, be uh, essentially uh, re recapitalized if you will and de-socialized so indeed a council communist society is actually only thinkable as um, a wholesale uh, socialist experiment, if you will, in which the um, in which the value form, in its at least in its current iteration, is abolished or is is reformed, if you will, and in which the uh, dominant um, version of the uh, of the legal form or the rights form is also um, is also abrogated. So. Um, you can't just do this um, sort of as as sort of a number of pockets, a number of islands uh, within the sphere of um, actually existing um, capitalism. So, of course, the uh, November Revolution in Germany did not uh, um, succeed. Um, the Soviet Union indeed, uh, indeed did become a Bolshevik uh, a party a dictatorship that was uh, sort of embattled and um, that increasingly uh, turned into uh, a Stalinist uh, version of yeah, state socialism or perhaps, perhaps even state capitalism. There's a whole body of literature, uh, of course, that debates that question. Um, and the council communist tendency in the 20s and 30s um, became increasingly marginal, but the council communists also worked on actually um, developing uh, the theory of council communism. So even though it couldn't be realized, this vision, they at least wanted to develop a, a theory that could work in principle, in theory, in the future. Um, and um, yeah, so we here we have some more sort of printed matter, basically, from the later 1920s and early 1930s, when this movement was already uh, being marginalized, also through the Comintern, uh, basically, and its uh, Western affiliates, such as the KPD in Germany, clamping down on and marginalizing these council communist tendencies. Here's um, a composition by Gerd Arns um, about uh, yeah, the uh, Räte system on the cover of um, a periodical published by the Allgeme Allgemeine uh, Arbeiterunion Einheitsorganisation, a council communist organization. And here on the right, um, this is something I want to focus on, is actually a model of the Räte system drawn uh, by the aforementioned um, Franz Wilhelm Seiwert uh, and published on the pages of uh, his um, uh, magazine or journal A bis Z. So what we have here is indeed Seiwert uh, trying to give us a visual um, sense of the Räte system as indeed uh, flowing uh, as, a, as a system in which power 
power is ultimately anchored in these councils and it flows upward, right? So the arrows point upward. Um, whether or not that would work actually is something that um, the council communist theorists uh, debated throughout the 20s and 30s and 40s and beyond. Uh, in the end, many came to the conclusion that yes, a form of central coordination would also be needed. So perhaps something that perhaps one would then need to um, redraw, uh, reimagine uh, Zywert's composition among more uh, cybernetic, uh, cybernetic lines, basically, as involving feedback, right? Arrows pointing upwards, but also downwards. Now, uh, one final characteristic of uh, the Council Communist theories that were developed by authors such as Jan Appel and Henk Kahnemeyer and Anton Pannekoek, uh, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, one feature that I would also like to mention is that these authors were indeed Marxists. So they actually did uh, try to come up with a calculation of labor hours, of socially necessary labor time, that would actually allow them also to determine value, to determine the value of, of, of goods, of products, and to set prices, right? So actually, as Marxists, they uh, actually try to calculate in labor hours directly. And they wanted to um, reduce the hold of the value form on, on society and on lives by actually turning money into something that might be used to indeed uh, represent labor time in certain situations. So they did not actually uh, try to achieve a moneyless economy in kind, a la Neurat, um, but the primary um, unit of measure, actually, uh, the primary unit of, of measurement would actually be labor time, labor hours, and money could be used by people, you know, for practical reasons to actually yeah, go to the shops, let's say, uh, but money would no longer uh, rule the world necessarily. Um, however, whether or not that actually amounts to a systemic alternative, right? Whether that is actually really a fundamental alternative to capitalism or in a sense, a kind of um, yeah, purified version of capitalism in which uh, uh, basically Marxist organizers and theorists try to calculate directly in labor hours rather than uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in the money form. That is a whole debate that is still ongoing and that I cannot really um, develop at length here uh, because I will run out of time quite soon. Um, and um, I would just briefly like to return then to the other side of the equation to uh, Otto Neurath's vision of this centrally planned economy in kind and to also the visual um, um, version of that uh, vision in the form of the isotype system of pictorial statistics which was, as I mentioned, indeed also elaborated largely uh, by the council communist artist Gerd Arns. So here we see this collaboration and a certain uh, hybrid hybridization, if you will. Um, and um, in the Atlas Gesellschaft und Wirtschaft, for instance, from 1930, uh, we indeed see that Neurath and Arns and other collaborators uh, try to um, almost um, give a glimpse of what um, a different uh, way of organizing the economy could look like, could literally look like, if we focus not on the money form, not on the value form, but on uh, different um, quantities, different relations, quantities of actual uh, goods, actual products, uh, quantities, and also relations then between uh, different uh, types of products. Now, one really important aspect, I think, of Neurath's uh, vision, which indeed kept he kept developing it, and he also then applied it towards the very end of his life to another war economy, right? So his vision was originally also developed on the basis of what he um, what he saw during the First World War, when countries such as Germany and Austro-Hungary actually did have a largely centralized war economy, right? Because a lot of coordination was needed for that war effort. So Neurath thought, well, we can use that as the basis for this future socialist planned economy in kind. And then towards the end of his life, he found himself in another world war, the Second World War. And he again also uh, used um, his, uh, let's say, skills to um, give a sense of how that uh, worked and how that might be uh, uh, sort of improved and planned better. Now, one feature that I think isn't really 
um, doesn't really get enough attention is that Neurath, you know, even though we could we could very easily present him as this typical early 20th century productivist, you know, Stakhanovist. It's all about production. It's all about industrial output. Um, and he is he is largely blind indeed also uh, to the colonial dimension, not entirely, but largely. Um, I would say that uh, one still potentially very productive um, point of his thinking is that he is not entirely oblivious to the fact that there are actually other values than purely industrial output, you know, quantity, quantity of output. So for instance, um, he um, has this fascinating passage in which he says that, well, for instance, when exploiting coal, right, when exploiting coal mines, one would, one would have to weigh the Schonung der Kohlenlager against the Schonung der Menschen. So what concerns Neurath here, for instance, is not so much the ecological consequences of uh, carbon fuel extraction, but the economic and social consequences of, of using up all the coal before alternative energy sources would have been developed. Uh, it would be ahistorical to expect a kind of post-1960s ecological um, consciousness from Neurath, but his insistence on the political nature of decisions about yeah how to weigh different values against each other can easily be enriched with ecological dimensions, I would say. Um, so Neurath has this great sentence, which I'm quoting in German, where he says, man kann Wirtschaftspläne nur so miteinander vergleichen, wie man Birnen oder Bücher miteinander vergleicht. Den einen Wirtschaftsplan dem anderen aufgrund einer Gesamteinschätzung vorziehen. So basically what Neurath says is, well, there's always the matter of actually making decisions based on social and political values, right? It's, it's not sort of, um, it, it's not an algorithm or if it is an algorithm, then indeed who programs it? What kind of decision, what kind of biases go into it, right? Do we indeed value uh, output um, uh, production more than um, basically human lives or, um, the uh, the ecosystem that uh, sustains that sustains human lives, right? So this focus actually also on a plurality of values, um, I think, is one element of Neurath's work that one can also use indeed to challenge the the imperialism of uh, the value form. Now Neurath, of course, and Neurath and Arns and other uh, artists and activists who were involved and their system of um, built statistic isotype has of course also been used in recent years by, uh, by artists such as for instance, And Andrea Siegmann and Andres uh, Alice Kreischer. Uh, Siegmann and Kreischer have sort of re, um, basically remade, reimagined a lot of the uh, Tafeln, a lot of the plates from the aforementioned Atlas uh, Gesellschaft und Wirtschaft. They've updated them in contemporary terms. So for instance, this is a version of uh, um, plate, I think, 66 in this atlas, which uh, Siegmann, uh, and again, the whole project is a collaboration with uh, his partner, Alice Kreischer, which Siegmann then has turned into a plate about Bitcoin mining. And what are the actual costs of Bitcoin mining? So um, here we see then uh, the uh, sort of uh, server power required. So we see the um, ecological uh, costs, the energy required for mining uh, Bitcoin and of course uh, the um, whole um, setup of Bitcoin is as follows that it gets more and more costly and hence more and more ecologically destructive uh, to mine uh, Bitcoin. So this is then expressed in the um, uh, power plant symbols, which you can see here at the bottom. So uh, here we can see the a sort of increase in 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 the uh, amount of energy that's required. Uh, interestingly, uh, Brenna mentioned an artist who's closely affiliated with um, uh, Andrea Siegmann and Alice Kreischer, Dirk Schmidt. Right? These are closely interlinked uh, practices. Uh, so that's a very nice uh, uh, felicitous coincidence, I would say. Now, um, when um, Siegmann and Kreischer um, sort of um, update the work of Neurath and, and Arns and other artists who uh, worked with Neurath. Um, there is, I think, indeed, this sense that we can use this kind of visualization to create a debate about uh, the value form 
and sort of the price, if you will, the price that we pay for the imperialism of the value form, right? What might other values, other criteria uh, be? And how can we challenge this imperialism? Of course, we inhabit this uh, neoliberal um, sort of um, ideological habitus that was uh, carefully constructed over decades, precisely also by um, neoclassical, uh, neoliberal economists, economic theorists, such as Hayek, right? Hayek um, and others, uh, Friedman, uh, working with various think tanks, um, constructed this uh, a world in which there apparently is no alternative, right? So uh, uh, Andreas Siegmann also created this series on think tanks in which he, for instance, visualized the Mont Pelerin Society founded or co-founded by Hayek as, yeah, this uh, literally as this think tank, as this war machine uh, that was designed to basically discredit any alternatives um, out there. And Hayek, for instance, also um, visited uh, Chile under Pinochet, right? And so Pinochet under Chile uh, was one example of a socialist experiment that um, actually tried to realize a, uh, a version of, um, yeah, of planning, of socialist planning in the early 1970s that was uh, brutally sort of stamped out through this US-backed coup. And in recent years, there's been a lot of interest. Um, there's almost been a kind of fetishization, we might say, of this Cuban uh, experiment, this Cuban planned economy, um, which took the form of uh, Project Cybersyn um, in the early 1970s. And yeah, there's this amazing sort of uh, operations room that's straight out of a, a 19, early 1970s sci-fi movie. So, you know, it, it has a certain amount of, uh, let's say, glamour or sex appeal. Uh, but Cyrusin wasn't just this operations room. So working together with the British uh, cybernetician Stafford Beer, uh, a, a Chilean um, group working uh, under Allende, tried to actually create uh, a version, a planned economy that would neither be completely top down nor completely bottom up. So in um, companies and factories, you had a certain degree of self-management. It's perhaps not the ideal of the workers' council, but there was a certain degree of self-management. And then there was this idea of indeed a, a sort of central planning board that would use uh, the latest tools, well, not quite the latest tools, some fairly outdated old-fashioned IBM computers that, you know, that they had in Chile. They didn't have a lot of money and they didn't have the the latest gear necessarily, but they had a, a limited number of IBM computers. They tried to use also low-tech technology like, like a, a phone network to um, gather information and to then arrive at decisions. Now, interestingly enough, also here, the focus in Cybersyn wasn't on money. It wasn't on the money farm, but it was really on uh, different types of uh, basically needs, different types of, of products that were needed in terms of in terms of food, in terms of food, in terms of all kinds of um, yeah uh, supplies that people needed uh, for living uh, and for yeah for living well, hopefully. Um, so there is, I would say, a kind of uh, covert, uh, un a kind of unintentional no, uh, Neuratian element here. Uh, it's not a pure economy in kind, of course, and Neurath also was aware of the fact that you can't realize that overnight, and perhaps you will never be able to realize that fully. But there is an attempt also in Chile to uh, affect a shift in emphasis, to not primarily think in monetary terms, but to think in terms of yeah, naturalian, to think uh, actually in kind indeed. Now, I will try to wrap things up within five minutes. Don't worry too much. But uh, now I finally arrived uh, in, um, in the present. And um, we're finally then back to where we started or what I already announced at the beginning, this contemporary version, this contemporary reenactment of the socialist uh, calculation debate, the socialist uh, planning debate. So once more, we have authors actually looking at um, actually existing contemporary organizational forms and um, asking whether they could not actually be seen as nuclei, as incubators of 
a future planned socialist economy. So actually, um, as I already mentioned, the uh, war economy of the First World War was really important for a lot of the early theorists of planning, certainly for Neurath, because in this war economy, the state actually did direct output, did direct production to a significant extent. The state did set prices. But for instance, Lenin also considered the Deutsche Post, the German mail system, to be uh, an example of sorts, a role model of how you could actually plan, how you can organize, how you can plan without um, a monetary exchange. Because within a large organization, within a large organization such as the mail system, uh, within large companies, um, we actually do have uh, forms of exchange that are not monetary. We have forms of planning. Uh, we have uh, uh, a CEO, for instance, or some kind of committee uh, telling a branch of the company, telling a branch of the organization to do this or that. Uh, and in contemporary companies such as here, for instance, Walmart or Amazon, um, we of course see that the latest uh, tools are being used uh, for forms of planning that were unthinkable. Uh, obviously, in the early 20th century. So we have uh, forms of uh, yeah, just-in-time production. Uh, we have algorithms uh, that um, uh, basically allocate uh, goods, allocate products, allocate warehouse space um, in the blink of an eye or less than that. Uh, and we have a kind of planning in real time, constant adjustment. And we also have um, sort of predictive uh, algorithms uh, that can indeed use past performance uh, to foretell um, future demand. So this is being used by authors such as here, Lee Phillips and uh, 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 Michal uh, Rozworski to argue once more that there may be a chance here to use uh, some of the elements that are already out there in actually existing capitalism and to indeed um, radicalize them to to appropriate them, to socialize them, to actually create um, a socialist and socialized economy. Now, this again raises many questions. Um, many are quite skeptical as to, uh, yeah, whether actually not, uh, whether there isn't a tendency here, just as there was a tendency in the 1920s and 1930s to actually um, take too many characteristics of capitalism for granted, right? To say, okay, basically we can take this organizational form, we can take these companies, these factories, these organizations, but we socialize them and fundamentally they will still somehow keep doing what they're doing anyway, right? So is there not actually also a, a sort of a limited, a limitation here in this social imaginary? Um, is this not an attempt to uh, basically, yeah, do what the Soviet Union ended up doing, basically keep running the, the same machinery, but just a lot worse than um, capitalism was able uh, to do it. Is this not ultimately a kind of a really shitty version of capitalism uh, that we would end up uh, creating? What does it mean to socialize, um, actually, right? So that also returns us to this question. Yeah, you can't socialize a single uh, company for starters, right? It would have to actually uh, involve a revolutionary process in which many of the uh, givens, many of the things that are taken for granted are actually uh, re-examined. Many more parameters would actually need to be uh, altered. We can't just say basically we keep everything as is, but now it's run by workers' councils and they will basically do the same thing as CEOs and, and boards were, were doing beforehand, right? Clearly that can't be it. Um, there are, however, these, I think, provocations also from artists, these are, shall we say, these propositions developed by artists that I think are very useful in order to at least begin that kind of discussion. So the artist Jonas Stahl, for instance, together with the lawyer Jan Fermon, uh, started the campaign uh, Collectivize Facebook, um, which is indeed a proposal uh, to force uh, the, the collectivization, the socialization of uh, Facebook, because essentially Facebook is too important to be run um, in the way that it is currently being run as a um, yeah, financialized um, uh, multinational or transnational corporation. Uh, but yeah, this raises all kinds of questions. Also, if we 
if we say that, okay, this then would mean that a socialized or collectivized version of Facebook would be run by councils, for instance, well, who would staff those councils, right? So clearly then also the whole idea of workers' councils in the early 20th century sense, where it was mostly sort of white male workers, um, presumably manning those councils, that would have to be reconsidered. And for instance, uh, Vinit uh, Agarwal also argued that if we think about Facebook and how Facebook could be collectivized or socialized, then we can't just think in terms of yeah, the people who work for Facebook in Silicon Valley or the users of Facebook in the West. We also need to uh, engage with uh, and take on board many forms of labor, paid and unpaid labor uh, in, the, in the global South. Um, all the unglamorous and unhealthy forms of upstream work, uh, as, um, as, as uh, it's known, that go into the um, maintenance of Facebook. Okay, um, this is where I end. Uh, well, I end with this. Apologies, I did go on for slightly too long, I think. But I will end with a final slide uh, showing the uh, proposal, again, a kind of propositional work uh, by Hito Steyl together with the uh, collective or cooperative inland founded by Fernando Garcia Dori. Uh, and here um, they um, developed a proposition for a, um, an alternative cryptocurrency named Cheesecoin. So inland is a Spanish or largely Spanish based cooperative uh, that uh, tries to uh, re-engage with, uh, with the land, with traditional uh, modes of, of uh, yeah, living on the land and working the land uh, in, in rural regions in Europe, but also beyond, I think. Um, and uh, Cheesecoin then is uh, uh, yeah, a proposal developed by Style with Inland for a cryptocurrency that would indeed be linked to those other values, those alternative values that Inland advocates. So users uh, can keep their balance in you know, their cheese coin balance to an app that allows them to create new exchanges and forms of value equ equivalence. For instance, then one cheese coin would equal one kilogram of cheese, would equal one sheep adoption, would equal one day of work at inland for five hours, or it would equal spending one night at inland or in inland's village. So here basically we're, we're in a sense back to the value form, to Marx's basic value form, right? The, the coat and a certain amount of linen being equal in terms of um, their exchange value. Um, but here precisely we have an attempt to um, yeah, to tweak the value form, to um, challenge its, um, its autonomy, its autonomy and its imperialism uh, by uh, linking it to the cheese standard, as they call it, instead of the gold standard. Um, so we see these uh, propositions by artists such as Steyl and Inland and Jonas Stahl. And I would also say indeed, um, artists like Andrea Siegmann and Alice Kreischer with their attempts to uh, reimagine uh, the Neurath Arns isotype system. Um, these are attempts indeed to uh, imagine and think a life, perhaps not beyond money altogether, perhaps not a life uh, without a single sort of version of the value form, but they are at least um, attempts to um, once again, reimagine a world in which the value form would not um, be um, rolled out in this imperialist manner, in which there would be certain checks and balances, and in which the value form itself could be socialized, could be collectivized, and in which various uh, actors, various agents, not just the traditional uh, sort of male Western factory workers of the early 20th century, could indeed. Um, adjust, um, challenge, but also transform, reform the value form, and I would add also the legal form in conjunction with that. So yeah, this is a little uh, sort of uh, insight into something I'm working on at the moment. This is very much work in uh, progress, so it has some, uh, some loose ends and some, uh, some rough edges, but perhaps that makes it all the more interesting to, uh, to discuss this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sven, um, for, uh, for your presentation.